Good afternoon and welcome to today's premium account market update for the month of August. Any individual reading or listening should discuss with their financial planner or advisor the merits of any recommendation or offer presented in this material for their own specific circumstances and realise that not all investments are appropriate for every individual. Presented today, myself, Leon Hine, the current Managing Director of Investor Signals, and the Investment Manager for the Investor Signals Model Portfolio. I have over 17 years of experience in the financial services industry and a licensed securities and derivatives advisor. The topics for today's presentation, we look at a quick summary of the macro update driving global equities. We roll through the ASX top 50 with a particular focus on 2014 earnings season which is which gets underway this week. Uh, also just mentioning that US earnings season draws to a close with this week sort of being the last of the major uh, weeks of, of earnings results for S&P 500 companies. We conclude today's presentation with a look at our asset allocation and portfolio view into the second half of 2014 and conclude with a short term market outlook. The services that Investor Signals provide are centred around a premium account service. It's a model portfolio of ASX top 50 stocks. We utilise the benefits of call options to enhance portfolio returns. We focus on effective ownership around ex-dividend dates, generating above average cash flow, allowing for some capital growth. It's a strict investment mandate, therefore suitable for superannuation funds and the assets remain in your name. If you'd like to know more about that, please contact myself, Leon at InvestorSignals.com, uh, using the details up on screen there. Moving straight into a graph of the US market and uh, focusing on the Dow Jones to start with. Now in prior recordings I've spoken about the earnings run rate of the S&P 500 and if we work on the basis that um, the S&P 500 companies deliver about $115 of earnings per share and if you applied a standard historical PE Effectively, the S&P 500 would be worth about 7% less than where it's trading at the moment and likewise the Dow Jones would be worth about 7% less. To put some specific numbers on that, that means that the Dow would be back down at around 15,500 points. So that's where I see the floor for US equities at. Now the reality is with a low interest rate environment, um, the pickup in US GDP that we've seen in the June quarter uh, and Overnight seeing better US factory orders we've seen, uh, which were actually the largest increase since July of last year. We've seen the US service sector continue to forge ahead. Uh, the ISM non-manufacturing index was strong. Uh, it was the highest reading since the survey's inception in 2008. So right at the moment, all the data in the US would suggest that earnings growth is underpinned by a gradual pickup in US GDP. Where probably some of the question mark occurs at the moment is really the Eurozone. At best the data coming out of there is mixed and there's still some concerns around China but I'll get to that in a moment. So our base case is that equity markets really stay within a range of somewhere close to their recent highs and at an absolute maximum you know uh, short term risk to the downside would be sort of 7% in the US market and I think on our domestic market you know, it's probably not much more than 3 or 4% and again I'll cover that uh, shortly. So as we draw to the conclusion of US earnings, the earnings run rate is supporting the fact that companies Top line revenue is growing around on average 6-7% and so too is the bottom line uh, er earnings number delivering around that 7 to 8 percent. Now that's a little bit down from where the market expected 12 months ago where the S&P would be tracking at about 10 percent underlying growth but nevertheless to be delivering a number around that 7 or 8 percent I think appeases the market and underpins equity valuation. So our base case again is that the US market albeit have some volatility around this level, the downside risk is 15 and a half but we could easily see the market stay at or near the recent highs. Uh, on that note, let's uh, just move to where we're seeing some cash flow. So I spoke about the issue there with Europe um, delivering sort of mixed uh, earnings and uh, economic numbers at best. What we're starting to see is a little bit of capital flow out of the Eurozone. This is a graph of the Shanghai Composite and I think broadly speaking money managers are starting to reposition on the long side of China again. Certainly the data around the housing um, and construction aspect of the Chinese economy is still in question but you know sometimes sort of you know when the 
news looks the worst is the best buying opportunity, and I think global money managers are starting to look at China again from a sort of a you know three to you know maybe eight year perspective uh, with valuations down at these levels. So I just flagged that from a macro perspective. Also just having a quick look at the US bond market. Now there's a lot of talk that you know equities are under pressure at the moment just on the prospect that the Fed continues easing back on its quantitative easing program or its bond buying program and ultimately starts raising rates next year. If we go to the bond prices, there's no evidence that the bond market is really starting to price that in. I'd spoken in the past that you know, really what we want to see is some start mild pick up in these bond yields to indicate that the bond market's outlook for the US economy is one where some inflation will ultimately begin building and the Federal Reserve will look to gradually begin increasing rates. At the moment there's no signal there in the bond market to suggest that's the case. We'll look back at this in another few months' time and just see whether these 10-year Treasury yields in the US ultimately find support at around 2.5% and gradually start trending a little bit higher. Uh, <coughs> Bringing that back to the domestic market, so if we go back a month or two, at 5,300 I thought the market was good value. We remain on the long side and we're fairly aggressive buyers of equities off that level. Uh, as the market's rallied up, we've been pretty aggressive. We're getting covered calls set across nearly all assets in portfolios and we're really locking in that premium from those covered calls and looking to collect the upcoming August-September dividends. From now, where do I see the downside risk for our market? It really is back to 5,300. That coincides with about sort of a 3 4% sell-off in our market, allowing for the US maybe having a 7 or 8%. Now, <clears throat> also, there's every possibility that our equity market finds support at or near where it is. I think we're coming into ex-dividend period. We've got some improving outlook for the materials sector. Industrials are likely to deliver uh, earnings growth around 8 to 10 percent, albeit you know, they're priced for, to perfection. I'll cover those PE ratios when we get to them. Um, the property trusts have had a great run. So I don't think there's a lot of room for expansion uh, in our index or our market, but equally I don't think there's a lot of downside risk. So at about 15 times forward earnings, just over a 4% dividend yield, I think there's still value to be had in owning good quality names, collecting the dividends and selling uh, the options to collect the call premium. So on that note, let's start moving through the top 50 and I'll reference as we come into earnings season. We've had Transurban sort of kick off earnings season uh, this week with a pretty solid number. I'll cover that in the back half of the presentation. Next week we get into companies such as GPT, uh, CBA, CSL, Suncorp, Crown, and a few others reporting, so I'll comment on that uh, as we move through. Up on screen at the moment is a graph of AGK. Now, our strategy here is the stock's trading at around 15 times earnings, trading at about a 4.5% dividend yield. The company came out and flagged that they're not likely to deliver 10% earnings growth as the market was expecting. I think it's rebased down here on the assumption that earnings remain flat. I expect AGK just keeps bouncing along here. We collected good premium. We got roughly 60 cents for the calls when we sold them when the stock was up at higher levels. So if you combine that 60 cents with the uh, dividend yield, which is around 60 cents, so we're generating about a dollar 20 of cash flow per annum out of holding AGK, um, which is almost you know close to 10% uh, cash flow that we're generating out of AGK. So the AGK remains a stock in portfolios that I think bounce sideways. I think you know, arguably in the short term it will struggle to grow earnings but uh, comfortable that as a cash contributor to portfolios it's okay continuing to hold that. Asiano, the company's delivering better bottom line performance through cost cutting, uh, gradually increasing their dividend payout ratio. Uh, will come back and revisit Asiano on the other side of earnings season. Amcor, we continue to like this name. I think it's a cornerstone investment for portfolios. Their exposure to emerging markets uh, makes sense. I think the company can continue to grow earnings somewhere between 5 to 10%. The market's looking for 10% earnings growth in there uh, in this reporting season. The stock trades on a dividend yield of about 4.5% on forward numbers. 
puts the stock on about 15 times next year earnings, but we own it at these levels and we're selling the covered calls up at around $11. In most cases, we're getting around 40 cents for those and we've gone out into the early part of next year. So again, when you combine that 40 cents of dividend income with the 40 cents of uh, I should say the 40 cents of pre option premium income with the dividend income, getting up to around 80, 90 cents of cash flow per annum out of Amcor, again getting close to 10% return there. Uh, and I think there's a high prospect of capital growth there in Amcor. AMP, it'll be interesting to look at their numbers. We're not doing anything here at the moment. I think it's probably trading a little bit expensive given the uncertainty around earnings. So it's one of those names we'll review on the other side. ANZ, about 3 to 5% earnings growth here. The stock trade at about uh, 15 times, sorry, about 13 times earnings on a 5.5% dividend yield. I think all the banks are really in the same situation where we had owned them at lower levels. We'd allowed about 5% growth in the share price. We'd sold the covered calls. In the case of ANZ, we sold calls at around that sort of $34 le $34 level, generated about 65 cents of income, and that was only for a short period. So for holding those, you know, really for not much more than about four or five months. So if we add that 60 cents to the dividend yield again, we're driving up around 10% cash flow out of ANZ. Um, <coughs> ASX, we continue to like this name here. We're interesting to have a look at their uh, earnings numbers as they come through over the next uh, fortnight with the stock trading on a PE of around 18 times current earnings, trading on about a 5% dividend yield. I still maintain that this is an asset that you want to own in portfolios at or near this level. Sell the covered call. We've been going out a little bit further in ASX to collect the premium there into March 2015. We generated around 80 cents of premium and again that complements the dividend to drive the cash flow. That call strikes up at fairly high levels up here at around $38, so giving us the opportunity for an effective exit price up at around $89, I should say. Uh, so if that doesn't get exercised, the combination of the option premium and the dividend yield driving close to 10% cash flow, but we continue to like ASX as a cornerstone asset for portfolios. AZJ, I'd spoken in the past about uh, some concerns here where it was unlikely to deliver the expectations of the market. The market was looking for about 20% earnings growth. I sort of had a view that maybe around 10 to 15% is where they ultimately sit. We're seeing a slight slip in some of their haulage volumes and the revenue that will be attached to it. They are focused on a cost-cutting program. From a yield perspective, the stock delivers about 3.5%. I still think this is an asset that makes sense to have exposure to. We bought it at lower levels. As it rallied up, we sold the 525 covered calls. We generated an extra 10 or 12 cents for those over the next few months, so again, driving that cash flow up uh, to higher levels from just the standard 3.5% dividend yield. BHP, we own this at lower levels. As it rallied up, we've started to look to sell the covered calls. Ideally, we want to give upside in BHP up to around sort of $41. We've got the upcoming dividend, uh, <clears throat> which will be around $0.65, cents, $0.70. Cents. Uh, our strategy here is to keep exposure to BHP as our preferred resource name. To put a valuation on it, the stock trades about 13 times earnings on a 3.5% dividend yield. The company should deliver this earnings season about $2.80 of earnings per share. So we'll revisit that on the other side. But we continue to like uh, BHP within the resource space. Brambles looking for about 10% earnings growth in their result. The stock trades at the moment at about um, at about 19 times forward earnings on a 3% dividend yield. Um, our strategy here again is owning it at these levels. We're aggressive buyers of it on the pullback at around $9. As it rallies up to these levels, we're capping the stock up at about $10. The call premium that we've been getting for that somewhere in the order of around $0.35. Cents. So again, combine that with the annual dividend of around $0.25. Cents. Uh, we're starting to drive that cash flow up towards 10%. Uh, CBA goes ex-dividend and they deliver their, they have a, their earnings release will come out uh, next week, next Wednesday, so we'll be interested to uh, have a look at that. They're trading at a fairly high PE relative to the other banks, not looking for too much upside, albeit should be well supported, still coming into the dividend. 
um, from a call option perspective, we'll probably really look to try to set calls up at around this $86 level. Uh, don't see it pushing too much above that across the next six months. Coca-Cola, I think this is a recovery. We've been waiting and being patient here on Coca-Cola coming into the upcoming dividend. The company should deliver probably somewhere in the order of uh, 50 cents of earnings per share. They'll probably pay out you know, somewhere around 45 cents of dividend uh, for the year. That'll put the stock back on about a 5.5% dividend yield. I think we expect commentary out of the CEO around the uh, cost-cutting program and stabilisation of the business. I think off the back of those factors, the stock could trade back up to closer to $10. At that point, we look to sell the covered calls, drive the extra cash flow while we wait for a broader uh, long-term recovery in Coca-Cola. But a combination of the dividend and that call premium, again, driving up to 10% cash flow out of Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> computer share. Trading on a very high PE up at these levels, this is one that we've been cautious on. We've been waiting for the stock to pull back a little. It's trading at about 25 times earnings. Granted, the probably will deliver close to 10% earnings growth, but you know, in an ideal world, we'd look for an opportunity to take another look at computer share back at around this $12 level, so not doing there at the moment. CSL. Um, Oh, look, I think this presents value. Coming into the earnings result in the next week or so, we'll look to see the company provide commentary around an extension of the $900 million uh, share buyback program that they've been running. I think in that environment, the stock could rally back towards around $70. So I think a buy on the dip opportunity down here it makes sense, and I'd keep this one on the watch list. Uh, Crown Casino, not doing there at the moment. From a valuation standpoint, it's starting to look a little more attractive, but maybe the risk here to Crown is that there's a, almost a $6 billion worth of development pipeline that uh, Crown are committing to. That may ultimately lead to some level of capital raising or um, higher gearing, and I think the market's just getting a little bit cautious in that regard. With the stock trading at about 17 times earnings, I'd expect it to find support at on near these levels, but not to do too much on the upside. Uh, Fortescue, we're not doing it there at present. Goodman Group, I spoke about these property trusts. Obviously, the great run that they've had, we're seeing yields compressed down. Goodman Group's now on to less than a 4% dividend yield, allowing for roughly about 8% earnings growth into the next 12 months. We see that yield creep back up over 4%, but you wouldn't think that we would see these property names compressed too much below a 4% dividend yield. So I'm likely to uh, the view that they're pretty close to resistance at this point, and either will bump sideways ways for the next six months or maybe pull back a little bit further. At Goodman Group, out of the property trust, we certainly like it, but it's a buy on the dip at $4.80, hard to justify owning it at these levels. Likewise with GPT, about 7% underlying earnings growth. The company will deliver dividends per share in the order of about $0.20. Cents. The stock trades on about 15 times earnings and on a 4% dividend yield. So again, the argument for the stock to really push too much higher from here, I think is, a little, is limited. So again, with the view that it bumps sideways, but any opportunity to pick it up on a pullback, we would welcome that. IAG delivered great insurance margins, and the stock trades at about 12 times earnings, on a, still on a 5.5% dividend yield. I think that's about fair value, so don't see too much more upside in IAG over the coming, say, six months. But again, if there was a substantial pullback somewhere around this 570, it would be worth taking a look at IAG. Uh, Luca, as I've flagged here, it's not really on our radar other than to say that the uh, CEO for the first time has come out and provided some fairly optimistic or positive outlook towards the mineral sand business over the next you know, two to three years, and I think that may be a catalyst for, keep, for us keeping a closer eye on Iluca in the coming months, but not doing there right at the moment. IPL, one of our preferred exposures, so the stock trades at about 14 times earnings on a 3.5% dividend yield, looking for the company to deliver at least 10% earnings growth, uh, and on that basis, the stock could trade back up to around that sort of 310, 320 level. Don't see an opportunity for it to perform too much above that. Um, I'd highlighted going back a few months here at around this sort of 260, 270, it was good value. When the stock traded up here to 310, we took the opportunity to sell the 320 calls into December. 
And again, if you combine the cash flow that we're getting from those calls with the dividend, driving that cash flow back up towards around 10%. Um, James Hardy, look, I think at these levels it's fair value. Look, there's obviously still some issues around the asbestos liability continuing to increase, some mixed data around US housing. And just on that, we've seen the Case Shiller house price in the US on an annualised basis sort of pull back uh, below 10% uh, and it had been running sort of north of that uh, and we're seeing some mixed data around the construction side but I still think um, you know the US housing recovery probably has a lot further to go and again as I said at the beginning of the recording I actually don't see any immediate risk to interest rates being pushed substantially higher in the US even across the next 12 to 18 months um, and, you know, and that's reinforced by really what the bond market's telling us. Lendlease, really like this name here, looking for commentary out of the company during their earnings season to reaffirm that they're expecting double digit earnings growth, but right at the moment the stock trades about 14 times earnings on a 3.5% dividend yield, so <coughs> the probability of it consolidating here I think is probably the most likely scenario, but it is a high quality asset that's likely to deliver above average earnings growth over the next few years. So we want to try to keep exposure to lend lease in portfolios right at the moment. Happy to own it here and sell the covered calls. We've been reasonably aggressive on the calls here with lend lease. Uh, we generated around 40 cents of premium for selling those uh, into November. So combine that with the upcoming dividend of around 22 cents. Uh, again, driving that cash flow close to uh, close to 10 percent. I skip. So Macquarie, I've been a bit negative on Macquarie. You can see the red circle on there. I've highlighted that the company was really priced to perfection. The market was looking for about 20 percent earnings growth. We've seen the company come out and announce to the market that the first half earnings are a little bit below trend. They've reassured the market that they're going to reach the number on a full year basis. But you know, I think the premium that's been priced into Macquarie will continue to be backed back out. The range for Macquarie could be as low as sort of $51, $52, uh, you know, sort of back to its highs. But given our view on the market that it broadly bumped sideways, I'd be very surprised to see Macquarie reverse trend and take out those highs anytime soon. So it's not until we get a period of consolidation that we might revisit Macquarie. But I think risks still sit to the downside there a little bit with Macquarie relative to other areas of the market. NAB, we continue to like this as a banking exposure, trading about 13 times earnings on a 6% dividend yield. The underlying earnings growth of NAB's arguably a little bit lower than the other names. Also, top line revenues a little bit less. Uh, cost con control is probably not quite as disciplined. They're obviously, investing heavily in upgrading technology systems at the moment. But, you know, the market's getting excited about them gradually uh, deleveraging and de-risking their exposure in the UK, and ultimately an, an equity market environment that allows them to spin off the UK assets and unlock some value. Um, I don't think that, whilst that probably closes the pricing gap a little bit on their peers in Australia, it's really a competitive issue and are they winning market share here in Australia. But I think NAB could arguably trade back up to around $36. Any push above the recent high, we would take that as an opportunity to look to sell covered calls up at around sort of $37 um, <coughs> in, into sort of the early part of the new year. Newcrest, um, it'll be interesting to see with Newcrest's earnings results out um, in about a week's time, the, there's a probab high probability that they'll deliver maybe somewhere in the order of maybe up to sort of 50 cents of earnings per share. The result actually comes out on the eight, Monday the 18th. So in the following recording there on or about the 20th, I'll make sure I provide you know, a fair bit of detail there around the new Crest earnings result. Uh, Origin, so in line with AGK, the utilities names are just under a little bit of pressure. I've highlighted about the high PE valuation there on Origin in the past. Um, from a valuation standpoint, the stock's trading about 20 times earnings on a 3.5% dividend yield. The company should deliver somewhere in the order of about 10% earnings growth this earnings season. So the market will be a bit disappointed if that doesn't happen. Um, again, the outlook statement may be key and uh, our view on Origin is that the real benefits of their uh, um, AP LNG project will really start to come online over the next 
you know, say 12 to 18 months. It's probably a really a buying on the dip opportunity. Hard to pick the exact bottom here in origin, but somewhere within the range of this sell-off here, we'd look to continue to rebuild exposure to origin for a rally higher in the uh, early part of to mid part of next year. Uh, Oil search, we really sort of started to back away from this name a little bit, maybe back here at around 874 has been where I've highlighted we're willing to take another look at oil search. Um, you know, there's a fair bit of euphoria that built in the market there with uh, better production numbers, better sales, and, and obviously the uh, first shipment of LNG from Papua New Guinea there. Uh, QBE, disappointing earnings results, no surprise, there's a long trend of QBE. Uh, not meeting their guidance um, from a valuation standpoint puts the stock you know, maybe somewhere around uh, around about a four and a half percent dividend yield but we're really not doing their in portfolios around QBE at the moment. Uh, Ramsey Healthcare continue to like this name I think is a defensive exposure that should continue to deliver high single digit earnings growth. Uh, Rio I think I, I spoken about the capitulation in the iron ore trade. Uh, I think we've certainly seen that um, and the commodity names are starting to improve but again our preference remains BHP over Rio. I think if Rio can push up and create new highs around this $70 level to take the opportunity and sell covered calls up at around $74 into the early part of, or mid part of next year I think probably caps the recovery there in Rio. Uh, SCG, so this is obviously the spin-off of uh, or the renaming of Westfield Retail Trust. Um, at these levels it's, the stock in my opinion is full value trading at around a 5% dividend yield. We've still got some uncertainty around the price they uh, fetch for some of the New Zealand uh, property assets that they're going to look to sell down to reduce the gearing levels and I think that's a little bit of a risk around the name I'd, and to put that in perspective probably no more than maybe 5% risk to the share price. I expect the stock to trade somewhere between you know, say 325 and 340 uh, and consolidate but again restricted by sort of the yield unlikely to compress too much further not looking for too much more upside there. Stocklands we continue to like this name we own it at lower levels the company should deliver about 8% earnings growth uh, <clears throat> from a, the stock that has gone ex dividend in June the next dividend won't be until December as it rallied up to these levels we've, ta we've taken the opportunity to sell the covered calls up at 410 combine that with the uh, say so 6% dividend yield, Stockland's delivering a cash flow for portfolios in excess of 10% and still allowing for upside growth there to $4.10. Uh, so depending how you look at it, if you add that call strike on, we're effectively delivering the stock at $4.20 if we get exercise and that's been a great run from the level that it's been at. Uh, Sonic Healthcare, I think this is one of our preferred names coming into earnings season. Uh, the stock trades on a relatively high uh, PE uh, of around 19 times earnings, roughly a 4% dividend yield. The company should deliver close to 10% earnings. We bought it at lower levels down here as it rallied up. We took the opportunity to sell the covered calls uh, at 18.50 into roughly November. We collected around 55 cents of premium for those, so it's really giving us an effective exit price up at $19. If we don't end up being exercised, combine that sort of 50 cents of premium that we've collected with the upcoming dividend, and that dividend's around sort of 34 cents, again driving that yield from 4% closer to 10%, so continuing to make sense there with Sonic. Uh, Santos, we own this at lower levels, we collected about 40 cents with a premium when the stock rallied up, we've capped that out giving us an effective exit price of around $15. I think the stock bumps sideways, arguably Santos is the deeper discounted value play within the oil and gas uh, sector, uh, maybe providing more upside than Woodside Petroleum over the course of 2015. Uh, Sydney Airport delivered okay results but not doing it there at the moment. Transurban, as I mentioned at the beginning, their earnings result came out, reaffirmed 34, 35 cents of dividend per share guidance. If the company continues to deliver on their uh, earnings forecast, we should see that dividend increase from current levels of around 35 cents up to around 40 cents a share over the next two years. So I think that underpins the price of Transurban, even in an environment the bond yields gradually start to creep up a little. So happy to 
take another look at being buyers of Transurban on any major sell-off. To the extent where we own it at lower levels, uh, for at the top of this rally, we sold the covered calls at around this 795 level into the end of the year, and I'd ex we collect a reasonable premium for those again, sort of t uh, roughly around 22 cents of premium, so giving us an effective exit price up at around eight dollars ten there in Transurban. If we don't get exercise, combine that call premium with the dividend, getting that that 10 percent cash flow out of it. So the story there continues to make sense with Transurban. As with Telstra, we've repositioned in this name on the long side. We want to keep the exposure coming into the upcoming dividend around 14 cents. Maybe looking for commentary from the company around a $2 billion share buyback. Um, from a valuation standpoint, Telstra is now pushing back up to about 16 times earnings and about 5% dividend yield, so not looking for too much further upside. Toll flat earnings, probably somewhere around uh, 40 cents of earnings per share. Uh, they're paying out about 28 cents of that in dividend, puts the stock on about a 5.5% yield. So from a relative valuation to other areas of the market. The PE appears reasonably cheap, but the prospect of toll delivering earnings growth is pretty slim. Um, our strategy there is to the extent that we own the stock, sell the covered calls around the 575 level. Uh, Westpac continue to like this name. Uh, we've been fairly aggressive when the stock rallied up here. We sold the calls in Westpac up at around the 35.29 level into September, and again we collected uh, around 73 cents of premium there. So effectively giving us an exit price of 36 dollars there in Westpac. If the stock stays under that level, uh, what that will mean is a combination of the uh, 5.5% dividend yield plus the call premium, we're getting about 10%. From an earnings growth, whether it's CBA, Westpac, ANZ, NAB, I really think the numbers are probably somewhere around that 3 to 5% underlying uh, business growth. We're going to have less uh, reprovisioning of bad loans to bolster that profit. So I think we, you know, we start to sort of focus on uh, flat payout uh, ratios. Um, and less contribution from uh, add back provisions from uh, provision loans in the past. So we'll start to see sort of a more core uh, growth rate in these banks and I think that sort of is attractive at around 3 to 5 percent but probably unlikely to really drive any short term substantial increases in share price. Again, maybe about 5% from the current levels. Wes Farmers, to put some numbers on this, about 19 times earnings on a 4.5% dividend yield. I think, again, this makes sense to keep this in portfolios, but we're going out into the early part of the new year, selling the covered calls and trying to drive that cash flow higher out of Wes Farmers at 19 times earnings and 4.5% yield and about 7% earnings growth. It's hard to build an argument that the stock really takes off from these levels, so a covered call strategy makes sense. Uh, Westfield, I think this is a buy on the dip down here. Anywhere back at around 7.30 is good value. Puts the stock back on about a 5% dividend yield. I think it will deliver around 5% earnings growth over the next 12 months and it's a buy on the dip story for us. The mining services sector still remains under pressure. Woolworths trading about 19 times earnings, trading about just under a 4% dividend yield makes the stock expensive. At best, it bounces sideways through here again. It's a cash flow contributor to, share, to portfolios, owning the stock, collecting the 4% dividend yield, selling the covered call, driving that cash flow up to 10%. Woodside Petroleum, so we've seen in the news where the uh, buyback to remove Shell or the bulk of Shell from the share registry was blocked. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome of that is uh, on a longer term strategic perspective for Woodside. From a valuation point of view, the stock trades about 14.5 times earnings on 5.5% dividend yield. We've seen uh, good production numbers, solid earnings growth out of Woodside with the stock you know, on a solid yield and with earnings growth maybe on a forecast basis you know, somewhere around you know, flat to up 5%. I think the outcome here is the stock really bounces sideways and at best it's sort of a, a tight covered call strategy to collect the dividend and, uh, and sell the option to justify sort of holding the stock. And there we are. So that covers the uh, the top 50 stocks. Just to have a quick discussion on earnings season again next week. We look at GPT reporting their their results of interest around Wednesday of next week. We got CBA delivering their earnings release. 
We've got computer share as well. I've spoken about most of these names in the expected earnings growth. We've got CSL next Wednesday. And then in the back half of next week, out of interest, we have Goodman Group um, and uh, James Hardy. And also towards the end of next week, we've got the sales and revenue release for ANZ. Um, so throughout earnings season, I'll provide a few additional uh, updates uh, rather than just the new planned monthly uh, coverage of the markets just to ensure that uh, we're keeping on top of sort of the, these earnings results as they come through. Uh, again, to summarise our view on equity valuations and where we see the market heading and the portfolio allocation, I really think that with PE valuations stretched, uh, fairly muted underlying earnings growth in sort of mid to high single digit, uh, I think the probability of equity valuations really accelerating substantially over the next six months is reasonably low and in that environment it should continue to make sense to own the high quality names and sell the covered call options and drive that higher cash flow from the dividend and the call premium at the same time allowing for a capital growth within uh, the stocks rallying up to those call levels. Thank you for listening in. I look forward to speaking again soon. If you'd like more information on the Investor Signals Premium Account Service, please contact me using the details on screen.